Ladies and gentlemen, we are the Bundu boys. We got what we call mururu mururu. If I say mururu mururu, we go Ooh. Yeah, that's the Bundu way. In 1986, five young men from Harare arrived in the UK, their first ever trip outside their native Zimbabwe, let alone anywhere across the seas. All they had was their music embedded firmly in their souls, their massive talent and a burning desire to leave a lasting impression on world music. They called themselves the Bundu Boys and their music, Jiti. Zimbabwe gained independence from Britain in 1980. This was achieved after an armed struggle dubbed Chimurenga, during which young revolutionary cadres crossed borders regularly into neighboring countries to receive military training and skills to overthrow the settlers. While the battle was concentrated in the bush, it was waged on many other fronts as well. Music contributed an important battlefield. Artists such as Thomas Mabfumo, Zexi Manata, and Oliver Mutukudzi sang songs against minority rule and urged the freedom fighters to glory. In the sprawling township of Mfakose in Salisbury, a young artist took his guitar. He was starting his own warfare to break away from poverty and the injustices of colonialism, to take his musical ambitions to the highest level and break barriers. When Zimbabwe gained independence, thanks to the efforts of the dedicated liberators in the bush, the young ambitious musician had completed the first part of what was to become a dream coming true. He had assembled three other like-minded youths to form a band they were to name after the comrades in the bush war, the Bundu Boys. Rise Kagona was born of Malawian immigrant parents. He grew up playing a crude homemade guitar for passers-by in his neighborhood. It was not long before he grouped his musical friends to form the Wild Dragons. They played in beer halls where they were availed proper musical instruments. After losing vital band members early, Young Rise conscripted more youths from the city and formed yet another band, the King Croft Hippies. The coming of independence opened the country to wild scenes of jubilation and celebration. For the young nation, the honeymoon was just starting. However, for Rise, this meant losing band members to more established groups, rocking Harare heavier. He started all over again with new friends, Kenichi Chacha, Shepard Munyama, Mosha Marasha. They formed the Bundu Boys. Tired of singing cover versions, they decided to record their own material. The Bundu Boys approached Shed Studios, operated by property developer Steve Roskilly. Bundu Boys, um, they'd been playing um, around Highfield and what have you. And so, predominantly, they sort of crashed into our lives somehow. I don't quite remember how they arrived, but they arrived. Um, and what they had was something really quite fresh. It was raw, very raw. Um, but they clearly had something that was just out of the ordinary. And the first one, uh, Unashua Heri, was a, was a fairly good, solid, um, solid, um, di not discs in those days, record. The guitars were out of tune. The whole thing was extremely raw. Unashua Heri did not make much impact on the music charts. It didn't go anywhere else, it was just there. And it didn't do particularly well. It sold in the hundreds rather than the thousands. Undeterred, the youngsters moved on and recorded a second single. In 1981, 
Bothol Nyamondera was a young trainee engineer at Shed Studios. He had recorded other local artists, including Jona Moyo and the Deverangwena Jazz Band, but he recalls the time in the studio working on Kuro Jachete with the Bunda Boys. The rest of the young guys, we were all young but then, and uh, they came in and they wanted to do something and we discussed about it and uh, I like the I like the, the, the way the guys, they, they had nice ideas when, when I listened to what, what they had. And I thought it was something different uh, from what everyone else was doing that time. And um, we had um, the first single we did was Kuro Jachete. And um, it was very interesting because um, it caused quite a stay in, 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 in different homes between lodges and things. We find that one verse, one lodge would play that record and the landlord would get angry and say, hey, are you, are you, is this made for me or something? It was very interesting. And that was the first single we did. And uh, from there, we did an album. I can't remember the title now. But it had tracks like Yogi Chase, Mahesh Amariang, and stuff like that. And um, those early days, it was very, very interesting to work with those guys. And they were very creative and different, and I was also new in production, so I learned a lot from those guys. Although Kuro Jachete gained popularity, announcing the arrival of GT Music on radio, it never made it commercially. This once again meant the Bundu Boys would lose another musician to greener pastures. Washington Kavai, who was a replacement to Shepard Munyama, left to join Thomas Mapfumo's Blacks Unlimited. When young David Mankaba from Bulawayo joined, the band had, however, managed to lure young keyboard player Shakespeare Kangwena. The group was to remain unchanged for the next eight years. This fivesome became the trailblazing Bundu Boys. They played absolute jitty. <laughs> Of the five Bundus, Mosha Rodwell Marasha became the most recognized. Having been born with a big frame, he grew up with the pet name Biggie. And being of the zebra totem, of Mbizi or Tembo, he was to assume the stage name Biggie Tembo, the face of the Bundu boys. Although the other Bundus remained vital members of the band, with each expected to put maximum creativity into songwriting, composing and arranging, Biggie stood out. His compositions were the special ones, and his songs were the hits. His easygoing character and charm made him the natural frontman, and he was quickly appointed spokesperson for the band. The structure of the band was however shaky, with Biggie clearly visible as the frontman, while Rise remained in the shadows, calling the shots as the band's founder. All I wanted was to have a team and we make the most of it. In Zimbabwe, not many people knew me. Only musicians knew the history of our group, and most musicians knew. But I was, I always stayed at the back. What I was interested in is, at least, the money comes to me first. Biggie Tembo and Rice Kabona were the Pundu boys. Rice Kabona, in a way, was, is also a writer. And also, in terms of instrument, he would do it to, uh, to accompany the voice. Kubata needs a group, Rise was very good. Then, um, but the driver, I can say, was big too. Hatisi Tose was the Bundu Boy's first major hit. The single sold well, and was well received by both club and radio audiences. It stayed on the charts for several months. Biggie, inspired by real life events in his marriage, had written the song. <laughs> <laughs> Biggie married his childhood sweetheart Ratizai in 1980. In 1982, the couple were blessed with a baby boy.
By the mid-80s, it seemed as if the boys had reached their peak. Little did they know what was in store for them. In 1985, exactly five years after their formation, things took a dramatically positive twist. In what was probably a first for a Zimbabwean band, the Bundu boys found themselves staring Europe in the face with a six-date tour of the UK. Just about to release the second album um, into Britain and Gordon suddenly turned up uh, one day and, and got in touch with the band and said, um, can I bring you over to Britain on a tour? I'll, I'll organise you a tour. So we got in touch with, with us and I mean, that was, wasn't really for us to say whether they could or whether they couldn't go. That, they're, they're free agents, they're just the recording things we were dealing with. So, but we obviously thought, well, this is actually a good idea because they need to go and promote their material. Great stuff. So that time, Artistos and Kuroja Chet and uh, uh, there was another, uh, the Safirio Mazikatiri one. Uh, Chegu Juga Chose. Chegu Juga Chose. Tango yeah. yeah that was a good one. They were doing very well yeah. in the country that time. So Steve just said, okay, I'll look for a band to give you. That's when he, Steve told us, you guys, do you think you, you'd want to go to Britain? I said, why not? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the boys. Julie arrived at, uh, I think it must have been Heathrow, I think Gordon must have met them because we were, uh, they had a gig, we had a gig that night up in, up in Glasgow, um, I think he met them and uh, he met them at the uh, airport and they were, they had uh, some person who claimed to be their manager in tow who we <laughs> got rid of fairly shortly, he obviously had nothing to do with them. Um, but they, they came, um, they had no instruments with them. And these guys were looking forward to hear from, to see us with our instruments, traveling or coming from the, from the airplane with the guitars and whatever, amplifiers and all that. And there we had only these small bags <laughs> with us. Not even clothes for me at all. With, with only clothes to change over what you are wearing. <laughs> we assumed it was them, and, and so um, I think what happened, we, we took them up by train. I think Gordon uh, flew up from London to to sort out some instruments for that for the gig that night. Um, I had some stuff, so we went up on the up on the train. When the tour was done, the band and their promoters found themselves with no money after having bought instruments on a higher purchase deal. Realizing that the Bundus would return home empty-handed, Doug and Owen, the tour's promoters, got in touch with a young graphic designer who had a known passion for world music and African music in particular. Gordon Muir immediately fell in love with the Jitty Beat. He was quick to realize that to make any impact with the Bundus, they had to endure the grueling student circuit, jamming non-stop at universities and colleges around Britain. Andy Kershaw, a top entertainment journalist, was to follow the Bundus on their circuit and fell in love with their music. He wrote some of the most riveting reviews of their performances. Soon, word got around there was an African band playing some serious stuff on the student circuit, and Gordon, who was acting as the group's manager, was able to convince Steve back in Harare to have some of the Bundus' earlier hits re-released in the UK under Owen and Doug's Disca Freak label. Shabini was released in the UK and immediately legendary BBC DJ John Peel got hooked onto the beat. And like everything he got hooked onto, his multitudes of listeners across the country followed suit. Shabini entered the world music charts at number three in the UK and stayed there for several weeks. 
With good media coverage, the fans called for more Bundu releases. Kuro Jachete, Ziva Kawakava, and the Chimurenga War inspired Trimbo Zemoto were reissued in the UK under Disca Freak to critical acclaim. Andy Kershaw became best friends with the frontman Biggie Tembo and went on to be best man at Biggie and Ratizai's wedding a few years later. Arriving home from their first tour, a high success judging from the massive airplay and good attendances at their gigs, and with Gordon Muir now officially their manager, the boys immediately released themselves from the Shed Studio contract. All that happened is that by the time the tour had finished and they came back to Zimbabwe, uh, they, uh, Gordon had sort of got them to um, agree that there was no point in continuing to record in Zimbabwe anymore. They were coming up right up to the end of their contract by that stage, 1986. Okay. And um, so they basically said, look, we don't want to carry on. And, and re-sign the contract anymore. We'd like to pull away and have Gordon sort us out over there. So, very disappointing. You know, we'd mm. spent six years trying to get them to the point where they were finally into Europe, mm. and then suddenly it was all the rug pulled from under our feet, and there was absolutely nothing we could do about it. Mm. So, very, very disappointed. I was flat. I can't can tell you. I was really, really flat. It was. It was very hard to take that. Mm. Um, but anyway, there was, as I say, there was nothing we could do. Um, and so off they went. Free from Steve and Shed, the boys hastily returned to London where the limelight awaited them. Let's see where we stand. Come on, keep to the beat. Come on, let's join. 